Balancing is the bane of every competitive game out there. Obviously, you need to keep things at some level of balance, because otherwise you'll end up with something like a character that is completely busted. Something that completely breaks the game, either intentionally or unintentionally. Remember the first year or so of Overwatch when Roadhog's hook went through walls and Hanzo was shooting something with a hitbox closer to a log than an actual arrow? Or when every other play of the game was Mercy hiding in a corner waiting for a team wipe that she'd instantly undo? Some things like that, be they designed that way or or accidentally ending up as they are, are overpowered as hell. But on the other hand, too much balance and the game can get stale. In the name of balance, you might ditch some interesting ideas or mechanics, and now your game is more boring for it. A special character that once had something to make them stand out now has nothing going for them over others. And then, we get to Warhammer, as well as wargaming in general, but let's stick to one thing at a time. Certain characters, strategies, and occasionally entire armies have at one point or another been known for being the most unbalanced things possible. I wasn't around for it, but even as an Eldar player myself, I would dread to be around for the days of Taudar. So why doesn't GW just balance the game? Just make sure it's all nice and even? Well, as I really hope you've guessed, there's a whole lot of work that goes into that ideal if you don't want Warhammer to be a very boring affair. And while I'm not a game dev, allow me to explain in my vastly underqualified way why Warhammer is such a pain to get right on the tabletop. In fact, since we're going to be talking about it, balancing something like Warhammer takes some smarts. Basic math is ideal, and you probably got to have some knowledge of statistics too. You know where you can learn those things? Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant is the best way to learn math, data, and computer science with fun and engaging lessons, with new ones added every month. Fun and engaging lessons to me being the sticking point. You know how much I retain from every math class up to now in my life? You don't have to guess because I can tell you. No further than roughly an 8th grade level at the very best. I know this because my sister asked me for help with her homework. I said, sure thing, let me take a look. And then I was looking at something that in my mind might as well have been ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. I didn't retain anything because I was too busy in school sleeping or weeping or generally wishing I was anywhere in my life but math class. But with Brilliant, that's not an issue because you're not only having a fun lesson, you're having a fun lesson on your own time at your own pace chosen by you. You're not being dragged along through some miserable course or other. You yourself are choosing what to learn learn and when to learn it. And despite what your science teacher told you, or at least unlike what mine told me, learning can actually be enjoyable if you're not being raked over the coals while you do it. If you're curious what course to take, in spirit of this video, I'd recommend predicting with probability. At the end of the day, Warhammer's got a lot of probability in it, even if it's ultimately the probability of this model killing that model. Who's to say brushing up on that sort of thing will help you out in some tabletop matches? And just to give you even more reasons to try Brilliant out, here's a little something something from me to you. Using my link in the description or pinned comment, you can get the first 30 days of Brilliant free of charge, and the first 200 of you to do so will get 20% off your annual plan. That's http colon slash slash brilliant.org slash pancreas no work slash for a 30 day free trial and 20% off the annual plan for the first 200 of you to use it. So what are you waiting for, viewer? Get Brilliant today and start learning now. Now then, onto the balancing act. And if you're wondering, yes, I do feel way more clever for that one than I should. First off, let's just get something easy out of the way. Warhammer in any of its forms should never be perfectly balanced. You know what game is perfectly balanced? Chess. Every side has the exact same pieces which do the exact same things on a perfectly even board. And if I wanted to play chess, I'd just go play chess. And I don't think it should be near perfectly balanced either. Something like Call of Duty, where yes, chances are most people have different weapons with different attachments, but ultimately things aren't that different from one another. Or where every side has access to the same equipment. That can be fun, but it's not Warhammer. Warhammer should be asymmetrically balanced, the idea for that being that every faction has things they do better than others or in a way that even similar factions aren't able to match. To compensate, they'll have something that they either perform very poorly or just flat out can't do. The Eldar are fast as hell, are powerful psychers, and can dish out beatings like no one's business. To balance this out, they're fragile as hell hell, and any unit that's out of position in any way, shape, or form may as well be dead for all the good it'll do you. That is an incredibly general and non-nuanced look at the core of the Eldar army on the tabletop. Please also understand that I am going to be saying things like asymmetrically balanced for the rest of this video. YouTube doesn't give me many chances to use my college education, and I would like to at least pretend I got something out of it. There's a few ways you can achieve this. Because I enjoy radically simplifying things that need far more nuance than I can or care to give, here's a nice Venn diagram with three parts. In them, we'll put speed, strength, and toughness. These, of course, aren't the only things that make up a Warhammer model stat sheet, but for the sake of simplicity, everything on a unit's information sheet here comes together to place them somewhere on this Venn diagram. There's also probably a better way 
a Venn diagram to showcase my points, but I couldn't think of one, so what are you gonna do? Leadership, wounds, save, and of course toughness come together to form their toughness, their accuracy, strength, and damage come together to form their strength, and movement is their speed. Slightly different terminology and gameplay between the different Warhammer games, but same general concepts. When it comes to balancing units, as a general rule of thumb, it's best to not have anyone fall right in the middle. A unit with the resilience to ignore any hit, the strength to butcher anything that comes their way, and to speed to place them exactly where they need to be. The Eldar are pretty firmly in that little bubble between strength and speed, lacking almost any kind of major staying power but being able to zip across the board and dish out damage. In theory, simple enough to balance. Of course, once you start actually balancing things, you find out that it's not nearly so simple. For one, let's just look at an army like the Eldar. Take a quick trip over to the web store and oh, would you look at that, 68 things for you to buy. Now, in all fairness, this does include data cards, terrain, Forge World minis, and the Harlequins after the army merge, but even still, that is an extensive list of things you have to balance. And that's purely within one army. Warhammer 40k alone has 32 armies, assuming you decide to count every single Space Marine chapter as shown on the web store a unique army. Even if you don't, that's 21 armies, which is still a whole lot of armies. What that involves when it comes to balance is playtesting multiple armies, multiple army compositions of the same army, similar army compositions but at all different sizes of gameplay. What if one squad of Guardians is weak as hell, but two squads of them turns into something that mathematically no one in the game can hope to defeat for one reason or another? Well, obviously, you need to fix that. But Warhammer's also a dice game, remember. Mathematically, Angron's going to butcher an Eldar Warlock in close combat. Then the guy playing Angron suddenly cannot roll higher than a 2, the Warlock makes every save he actually has to roll, and Angron fails everything that Warlock sends back his way in return. Does that mean Angron is actually weak as shit and needs a buff? Or did the Dice Gods bless the Eldar player and that's just a one in a million unfortunate occurrence? That's the sort of thing that's always got to be kept in mind as well. Will increasing a unit's movement speed by one inch ultimately not do anything, or will it result in that model becoming ball-bustingly overpowered? And keep in mind, I've mostly just talked about looking solely at models or units as they are on their own. In all its main iterations, Warhammer is an army game. You don't have just Angron or a Warlock on the field, you also have the rest of their units behind them doing their own thing. You have units like Gilliman buffing their army and introducing entirely different avenues of play, even if on paper it's just bumping up a number by one or re-rolling some dice. It's the sort of thing that makes you go, that's not really that big of a deal at first glance until suddenly a unit's ballistic skill goes from hitting on a 4-up to a 3-up because they're nearby a certain character and now anything that so much as looks at them is Swiss cheese. And then, because Warhammer isn't done adding more layers of crap onto this game for you to consider, you have stratagems, warlord traits and command points, or things like psyker powers buffing a unit and turning it temporarily invincible. An army on the tabletop that looks like it'll fall apart in a stiff breeze might turn into the Juggernaut because it has the right characters and traits in it to buff it to glory. Meanwhile, the army you assumed would be invincible just got tabled because it didn't have the right combination of the above to be viable, so it's back to balancing we go. Even without looking at things like buffs, how a unit interacts with the rest of its army without them is highly worth considering. Did your math add up and Lehman Russ's combined with Guardsmen squads make a formidable but still beatable foe? Or does everyone who didn't shell out three grand for a guard army just have to accept that that combination is physically impossible to beat unless Mr. Guard rolls nothing but ones all game. And while the Venn diagram is an absolutely wonderful and flawless way of getting the basics visualized, it's also a lie. I've lied to you all and I don't feel bad. It doesn't tell you nearly everything because armies that can theoretically be at the same spot in it can play vastly differently. The Tau, for example, can hit pretty hard. The World Eaters can also hit pretty hard, but in a shocking turn of events, the Tau and the World Eaters are not the same army. If you were to tell people that they're similar armies because they both hit goodly, players of those armies are probably going to be upset with you. The Tau fold like laundry the moment you get into melee range with them, while the World Eaters don't understand why you would use a gun if not to club someone to death with it. And yeah, obviously there's more differences to those two than that, but I hope you see what I'm getting at. Range versus melee is yet another phenomenal shitstorm to have to balance, one that in my opinion Opinion is even harder than changing an overpowered or underpowered unit's stat line. Done right and both are viable. Done poorly and either a ranged army isn't going to be able to do anything because their shots suck or they're not going to be able to be beaten because everything melts well before it can get into melee range. Do you want to focus on ranged armies for an addition and leave melee armies feeling left out? Or do you want to focus on melee armies and leave anyone with a gun or a cannon feeling like they should have spent more time at the gym? The ultimate answer is of course to satisfy both players, but even a couple of inches added or taken away from a unit's range of attack can mean the difference between that unit being worthless, viable, or completely OP. And as always, there's more than just stats to consider. 
Deep striking wraith blades behind a gun line can ruin someone's plan, because now their wonderfully deadly battalion of fire warriors buffed with marker drones has to decide where to focus. If the fire warriors keep getting demolished by this, and the overall meta of Tau vs Eldar constantly results in Eldar victories, how do you fix that? Do you buff the fire warriors so they can handle this kind of situation? Do you nerf the wraith blades who keep putting the Tau in that tight space? What about doing nothing, because the Tau army isn't just fire warriors and you could supposedly deal with that situation in any number of ways? All of these options have their own nuances to consider. If you buff the Tau because of a few situations they don't excel in, what does that mean for the situations they do excel in? Suddenly the Tau now hit on a 2-up without any buffs and are able to fire across the map. Congratulations, you buffed the Tau! And now, they're the most hated army in the game because no one can touch them. Of course, if you don't buff them enough, functionally nothing has changed. Nerfing Wraithblades can also solve this situation, but now suddenly no one wants to play with Wraithblades, because not only are they useless in this situation, but every other situation you might want to use them in. And of course, there's doing nothing nothing and leaving both units as is. Doing nothing means that this is the ideal place you want the unit to be in, stamp of approval ready to ship, which means you still need to consider a lot of different things before you ultimately decide to do nothing. Are those units actually performing well, or do they need an update? Are players missing something that allows X situation to keep happening and once they figure it out all will be well, or does X situation keep happening because there's a fundamental flaw with the units involved? And for that matter, is there a problem if a unit has a fundamental flaw where it just breaks down. Nothing should be perfect after all. And again, this model's performing its role in an entire army, which is in turn performing its role in a game of several dozen armies. Some factions are designed to do one thing very well, so if you either nerf that faction or buff others to be equal to it, you're sort of ruining their thing. And of course, if you're still aiming for that asymmetrical balance, there's almost certainly going to be cases where an army's inherent abilities hard counter another army. So now you need to consider what we were just talking about, but at a faction-wide level. You can fix it quite easily, ultimately but then you lose out on the asymmetrical balance and loop back around to playing chess with more steps. Do you want that, or do you want to accept that some armies are going to statistically demolish certain other armies, who are in turn going to demolish other armies? It boils down to the question of what level of unfairness are you willing to accept, because depending on matchups, there are going to be times where one player is handicapped from the start. Not because they chose wrong in building their army, but because their army is just not a good matchup against their opponents. And all of this, mind you, is ignoring the fact that I've made it almost eight full pages into a script about balancing Warhammer without considering point costs. Going back to the Venn diagram, you've probably noticed plenty of armies are, in some way, firmly in the middle of it. They're fast, tough, and strong, performing all three of those areas relatively well. Like the Imperial Knights, who, while definitely not the fastest models in the game, aren't terribly slow either, and can usually lumber in the range of whatever gun they have perfectly well. Or the Custodes to a lesser degree, since even the mighty Custodian is not going to win a 1v1 with a Jaeger. With point costs, you can have individual units be all three, because they're more expensive. A Knight Warden hits hard, has 24 wounds, and moves at 10 inches a pop. It's also 435 points. It had damn well be better good at all three of those things. With point costs, you can increase or decrease the value of any given unit and in theory hope to balance it out without even touching its actual stats. It's the reason that horde armies are in any way remotely feasible. Sure, you can have 100 clan rats on the table at a time and still have 1500 points left out of a 2000 point army. They're cheap as hell, you should do that, but that's because clan rats are garbage. As you can probably guess from what I've been waffling on about this whole video, however, it's generally not that simple, or at least not that easy. And yes, there is a difference between easy and simple, fuck you. Everything I've used in examples so far has really been without looking at anything too specific, but for this, let's get into the specifics because I feel it's warranted. A unit of Wraith Guard comes at the very least with five of them, with two different weapons focused on either delivering one powerful attack or a random amount of lesser ones. While slow, with three wounds apiece and a save of two plus, you're gonna need either some heavy or or a massive amount of small arms fire to bring them down. Ignoring their point costs, you can make the argument that this is the best unit in the Eldar army. Plunk them down somewhere the enemy needs to be, and you either deny them that objective, or force them to reorient their whole gameplay plan around getting it from you. But then we take a look at their point cost. 190 points for 5 models, or 380 if you want to bring 10 of them to the field. That is not an insubstantial cost, and it only gets worse if you really want to utilize them. For starters, them being slow as hell is a major hindrance. 
If you're deep striking them, you have to deal with deploying them based on the deep strike requirements. If not, you have to consider bringing a wave serpent to the field to transport them, bumping their cost up by 145 points. And to truly make the best out of a unit of Wraith Guard, you should consider adding a Spirit Seer to that unit, adding another 65 points on top of that. If you choose to give a unit of Wraith Guard the maximum possible effectiveness, you're looking at 400 points for a unit of 5, or 590 for a unit of 10. Bare minimum, you've hit a fifth of a 2,000 point army on 7 models. For all that, you could be bringing a wide variety of other units, such as a vehicle designed to kill rather than mostly transport, as well as other less pricey infantry units that can fulfill the same role you took the Wraith Guard for. If you want your Wraith Guard to take on vehicles or other heavy hitters, why not bring Fire Dragons instead? You can get 10 of them for 10 points less than a half-strength unit of Wraith Guard at 170, and you don't need a Psyker to babysit them if you don't want. So the balancing here is whether or not your point cost is reflective of a unit's abilities and an acceptable price for their performance, or if they're over-costed and no one would ever bother taking them. Or of course, under-costed, where a unit is the only thing you take not because its stats render it a better choice, but because it's so good that what you're paying for it is an absolute steal. If Wraithguard were all 100 points for 10 of them, you would have absolutely no reason to not get them at that price. Sure, that's extreme, but it's a general issue when balancing point cost. Is a unit now overpowered on a statistical level, and something that needs to be changed? Or can you just fudge the point cost numbers a bit and leave it at that? To take it even further, there's the different levels of scale the game works on. For whatever reason, 2,000 points is in my mind the golden standard to base your balancing on. Totally up to personal preference, it's just what I kind of have in my head. So, what do you do when you take that sort of thing into account? What if a unit is blisteringly powerful in a 2,000 point game, completely sweeping the board and having entire battle plans made around it by both players. But in a 1,000 point game, it's absolute garbage. Maybe it works by buffing the whole army and there just aren't enough models to buff to get use out of it. Or maybe it just isn't cost effective enough and isn't worth it for one reason or another. Should a model be balanced for all levels of play, or is that not even worth it? Should something be relegated to useless as games go lower or higher in scale? There's clearly a limit where the answer is yes, because Warlord Titans exist and you can play them for the low, low cost of 5,500 points. But what about for models for normal human beings who aren't made out of money? We're almost done, but there's two more things I want to consider in this mess of balancing Warhammer, and one is the issue of newer armies. Introducing a newer army has literally every problem I've talked about, only with the added bonus that outside of controlled GW playtesting, they've never been used. GW now has to deal with players using strategies or unit compositions they've never previously considered, to say nothing of how powerful a new army should be at its release. Obviously, a new army shouldn't be able to single-handedly ruin every other army thrown at it, but you don't want to release a new army only for its rules to be astoundingly bad, either. You've got to find the sweet spot between this new army sucks so bad you must be ashamed of it, and this new army is broken because you want me to buy it. Same goes with new units, but with more emphasis on it fitting in with the roster of its parent army rather than the game as a whole. And the last thing to consider is a faction's lore. Now you might say lore is just lore and has nothing to do with gameplay, but let's be honest with ourselves, that's not true. Almost no one starts playing Warhammer solely because the rule set is appealing to them or something like that. Sure, part of why people may ultimately pick an army is based on how it plays, but if you absolutely despise a faction's lore in every way possible, then you probably aren't going to collect them. Ignoring, of course, people who will buy the latest meta army, but those people are boring and I don't want to consider them for this. People like context to the games they're playing. Even in things like chess, there's some level of context. Why exactly does a knight need to be called a knight? Knights in historical battles never moved one foot to the right for every two feet forward they went. Or risk. Yeah, everything is the same mechanically across different colors, but it's at least different by having you capture and control countries. Mechanically, risk doesn't need any of that. It could be entirely played with squares representing territories and featureless pieces of cardboard representing troops. And yet there's been countless iterations of it, from Halo to Star Wars, because once you add that lore to it, it becomes a bit more fun, even if mechanically it's no different. There's even a 40k Risk, funnily enough. It's actually got the best mechanics of Risk I've ever seen, so hey, maybe go check that out. There's no version of Australia in it, if nothing else, which makes it leagues better than Risk normally is. Now your scumbag friend can't take High of Australias and then drag the game on for years while he slowly accumulates an army no one else can hope to match. But yeah, lore, it matters. 
People want their army to be at least somewhat reflective on the tabletop of how they are in the lore. The Imperium and Empire of Man both abhor the mutant. If you got one too many toes, you gotta go, my disgusting, abominable friend. So if you put in a chaos spawn or have your army have something like the Slaves to Darkness Demon Rewards table, it's not gonna feel right for those factions. But arguably, that's more of an army composition thing rather than specifically a balance thing. So how about this? The Custodes and Lore are unstoppable murder machines. Almost anything they fight in a 1v1 is gonna get a blitz by them. Even implying they could lose is something that sends Custodian fans into a frenzy. Unrelatedly, suck my clown cock. Obviously, on the tabletop, the Custodians should not be a weak horde army. Custodian units should be able to individually beat just about any other army's units in a 1v1. But they can't really be truly lore accurate either, because if you did, you'd have a Custodian player plop down a single squad of them and just declare he'd won the game. Or alternatively, the Eldar are described as moving faster than the human eye can comprehend, and Dark Eldar Incubi are described as moving so fast other Eldar can't see them. Following that logic, any tabletop game with the Eldar involved should end with the Eldar player doing that anime thing where they're howling banshees sheath their swords and the other player's army explodes. But that would probably be just a bit annoying for anyone playing against the Eldar, and if nothing else, the Eldar players would get bored after enough of that. To say nothing of bringing Gotrick to the table, a truly lore-accurate Gotrick on the tabletop would be him and Felix versus every other model in the game, and it would be an even fight. So for one final balance concern, how far do you take the lore? You can't really just ignore it or fans of that army won't be happy, but if you follow the lore to the letter, then the mechanics of the army will suffer in turn. And for those reasons, and many, many more, it's quite hard to balance the fun little game we call Warhammer. This is, of course, without diving into too many specific quirks of any of the game systems. But fun fact, did you know Warhammer Fantasy was a nightmare of misfire tables and equipment adding or removing stats? GW remembers that well, as it turns out, because the old world is right back to that kind of stuff. And as far as I'm concerned, good. Originally, this video was going to be me droning on about how balanced Warhammer should be and how complicated it should be as well, but it turned into me rambling on about how hard to perfectly balance it is. This is probably the video with the most amount of nothing in it, because in full honesty, all I've really told you is that balancing Warhammer is hard. But hey, sometimes I want to make a video where I don't need to read a book or interrogate other Warhammer YouTubers beforehand to make sure I'm not feeding you garbage. This is my version of a day off, as it were. As for that original question, only as much as necessary and incredibly complicated. After all, Warhammer attracts a certain kind of person, doesn't it? The kind of person who thinks either poring over a rulebook for half a match or memorizing dozens of unit stat sheets is fun. Why let us down by simplifying and equalizing all the units in the game when we're clearly here for that? Thank you as always to my wonderful channel members. You are the balance to my Warhammer. Nebulous, but most certainly there and keeping things healthy. That's one of my weaker member jokes, I admit, but it's a hard video to work with for this. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to subscribe or become a member. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. Honestly though, in some small ways a completely unbalanced Warhammer would be fun. Like those joke Age of Sigma rules from 1st edition weren't inherently flawed, it's just that things like a mustache determining a model's strength is a bit much. Stuff like any model that spends more than two consecutive turns in melee with Gotrek instantly dies would be fun though. Or if there was a Caiaphas Kane model, they could give him a feature where he gives his player five victory points for every turn he's in combat. It can be something like his mere presence inspiring the troops to victory, or him being a perfect distraction for Amberly to do something sneaky like off-screen. Not at all balanced, but hey, I'd rather have fun than walk a tightrope.